Uh, ben, you're, you're muted, actually. So. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Go ahead and get started. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, title of the talk tonight is Common Medical Emergencies and How to Best Respond. Those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Ben Kiai. I'm a fourth year medical student at St. Louis University. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So, uh, first thing we'll do is just talk a little bit about the goals of the presentation. So, the intent tonight is to educate and inform everyone to hopefully provide some perspective. And then um, I think the most important goal is to encourage and motivate everyone uh, about the, uh, the, the need to um, train yourself and to be ready uh, for these kind of emergencies. You know, there's really no such thing as, as, as a bystander or someone who can't participate if something is, uh, is going on. And I want everyone to know uh, and hopefully feel that at the end of this talk that, that they can participate um, in, in caring for someone who's, who's having an emergency um, in some way or another. Um, the talk is not going to re replace the official need for a CPR course or basic life support or things of that nature. Um, and it's not really meant to be taken as personal medical advice. Um, you know, that being said, uh, the SHIL is, is working on um, organizing another CPR course, uh, an official in-person CPR course, hopefully by the UCD Fire Department, um, which if you didn't know, I'd like to give them a plug. They do do free CPR courses to local residents, I think once a month, but hopefully the show is going to be organizing a, uh, a CPR course um, for all, uh, all of our community. So please keep your uh, eyes and ears tuned for that. All right, with that, let's, let's talk about some definitions before we get started. So we keep throwing this word around CPR. What is CPR? CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's a big word, so let's break it down. Cardio means heart, pulmonary means lungs. And resuscitation means to bring back to life, to revive. So um, CPR is really just the act of giving repeated chest compressions along with rescue breaths, which we colloquially know as mouth to mouth. And the goal is to restore blood circulation and to provide oxygen to someone whose heart has stopped. Uh, we'll look at the steps a little bit and we'll, we'll go through the, the diagram. But again, um, you know, really you need uh, to have an in-person session with a trained individual to learn the, the steps and, and the, the proper way to do CPR. Uh, another definition I'd like to talk about before we move forward is AED. So an AED stands for Automated External Defibrillator. This is basically an electronic device, runoff batteries, that if you would attach it to someone's chest, it can detect uh, an abnormal heart rhythm and shock the heart back to normal. Uh, there are certain times when the heart stops that it can be shocked back to back to life, so to speak. Um, so this machine can tell when 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 there's uh, that situation is taking place and then automatically shock the heart uh, back into place. So every shul, every school, every camp, uh, every organization in in uh, in our community should have an AED. We should check it every couple months to make sure it's working. The U City has one in the back. Uh, in the corner, um, it's very, very important for for every institution to have an AD. And and you know, if you're at an institution that doesn't have one, please do reach out. I'm happy to help coordinate, and we'll make sure you you guys get one. Um, uh, it's very important, and hopefully throughout the talk, you'll see why. So, CPR and an AD on the left. Here's a diagram of basic CPR for an adult. It's different for a child. Similar but different. I like to just focus on steps two and four. So step two, you see chest compressions, hands placed over basically the, the sternum, over the heart and pressed down quickly. And the idea here is that as the compressions are taking place, the heart is being squeezed and blood is getting to the parts of the body it needs to, uh, because it can't pump itself, you're doing the pumping for it. And the most important um, organ that needs blood when a person's heart stop is the brain. So really those compressions are meant to get blood to the brain uh, and to keep the person, so to speak, alive until we're able to, to revive them. Uh, and step number four is the, uh, the rescue breaths, which is mouth to mouth, which the idea here is that you're pumping oxygenated um, air into the person's lungs. And as we know, the point of blood circulation is to get oxygen, oxygen to the vital organs and oxygen is required for life. So that's step two and step four. Uh, on the right side, you see an AED. This is what a typical AED would look like. It's a portable electronic device, has this wire coming out of it with these pads. Everything is pretty self-explanatory. When you do a CPR course, they will teach you how to use these. But ideally, um, what happens is you place the, 
the leads um, on the chest, one here, one here. You press the start button and the machine does the rest. It, it detects whether or not um, this is a, a shockable rhythm and it delivers a shock if necessary. And this device is used in, in between these steps. So CPR is done. And then in between certain steps, the device is used to try and revive the person if, uh, if it's a revivable uh, uh, a sort of cardiac arrest, which we'll talk about a little bit. So that segues us into our first medical emergency and that's cardiac arrest. So what is a cardiac arrest? So cardiac arrest is, is it's a simple definition. Anytime the heart stops beating, a person is in cardiac arrest. And I want you guys to think about this as primarily an electrical problem. Um, and we'll see what that means, you know, when we talk about some of the other emergencies. But cardiac arrest is, is an electrical problem. And the reason that is, is that the heart has a, a cluster of cells in it that uh, send out electric signals and tell the muscle to, to, to squeeze. And so anytime those cells are not able to correctly send out those um, electric signals, the heart will not beat properly. Either it'll stop beating or it won't beat properly. And that will uh, lead to a cardiac arrest or not enough oxygenated blood getting to the vital organs, especially the brain. And so common causes of a cardiac arrest are heart attack uh, and abnormal heart rhythm in and of itself, valve issues, lack of oxygen, so choking, drowning, things of that nature can all lead to a cardiac arrest. And so an important point here is that a heart attack is not the same thing as a cardiac arrest. We'll, we'll talk about heart attack on its own, but a, cardiac, a heart attack can lead to a cardiac arrest. So that's just one of the things that causes the heart to stop beating. And we'll talk about that a little more. So as you can imagine, cardiac arrest is fatal if it's not treated immediately. So when, do you, when, when are we concerned for uh, a cardiac arrest? How, what, when do we think someone's in cardiac arrest? Well, step number one is if they're unresponsive, and number two is if they're either not breathing or they don't have a pulse. So these two things in combination, um, we are very concerned that the person's heart is not beating. And so we need to you know, take immediate steps to prevent them from dying. So what are those steps? So number one, we're going to call EMS. So um, the first thing you want to do is, you know, if there's other people around, you have one person dedicated to going and uh, calling EMS. And then number two is whoever is trained in CPR, they need to begin CPR immediately. And number three is we're going to use that AED as soon as possible. So already we're on our first medical emergency. And here we see where CPR uh, is, is really necessary to, to save a life. Um, and then again, having that AED could be the difference between, between uh, reviving the person and then having to wait for, um, for, for the fire department to come and, and revive them in those few minutes in between could be critical and could mean, uh, you know, um, that the brain is not getting oxygen for a few minutes, which, as you know, could, could lead to, to debilitating injuries uh, down the line. So time is very important. So here are the steps. So you find someone unresponsive, you check their pulse. Uh, and again, this, this talk is not meant to teach you exactly the, the ins and outs of basic life support, but really to give an overview. So you check the pulse, you realize they're unresponsive, they're not breathing, they don't have a pulse notify 911, begin CPR, and then work in that AED. So uh, some of you may follow the news or uh, follow sports. And you know, last week, if you've heard, there was an NFL player, DeMar Hamlin, he um, collapsed on the, on, the, uh, on the field. So here's a picture of the tackle that, um, this is him over here, and he got hit straight in the chest over here. And he stood up afterwards and then uh, about like five seconds later, he just collapsed on the on the field, and it turns out he had a cardiac arrest. So you might be asking yourself, why would a you know twenty something year old healthy athletic male suddenly have a cardiac arrest? So you know, I figured we would talk a little bit about what happened with him, um, given that it's uh, relevant. So uh, what happened with him specifically is something called uh, commodio cordis. Um, in Latin, that just means agitation of the heart. So uh, specifically, anytime a person has a really hard blow to the, uh, to the specific area in the chest that's over the heart, uh, at the same time as what we call the upstroke of the T wave in this EKG lead. So it has to be at the right time in, the exactly, in exactly the right place. Uh, what happens is the heart becomes, so to speak, agitated. This disrupts the electrical activity and could cause someone to go into cardiac arrest. So as far as I know, this is what happened to, to DeMar Hamlin. Um, and uh, that's why he collapsed. Uh, he got up, his, uh, his heart was not beating correctly. And so blood wasn't getting 
uh, to the brain, and that's what caused him to collapse. Um, so you might ask, um, what what saved him? Well, I'm sure you can guess at this point. It's adult CPR and and an AED. He uh, they immediately started CPR on him. They got the AED. They got his heart running up and running while he was still on the court. And at that point, uh, they took him over to the to the ICU. Now, even if you know he he was revived, he still took a pretty pretty big you know injury, and his brain didn't have oxygen for a certain amount of time. So the the recovery is still pretty extensive. But the point is, his life was saved because of these steps. Um, and you know, some of the statistics have shown that initiation of CPR plus an AED within three to five minutes of a cardiac arrest could increase survival of, uh, to over eighty percent. You know, versus obviously, if if they're not treated, the patient would die. So that's cardiac arrest. Um, it's a big topic. It's it's one of the number one causes of uh, mortality uh, in the world is is heart issues. So. Uh, an important topic that takes us to a heart attack. So we said that heart attacks specifically can cause a cardiac arrest. So what's a heart attack? Let's talk a little bit about normal anatomy. So here you have a heart. The heart is a muscle, and like all muscles, uh, it requires blood and oxygen to to function. So <clears throat> the blood supply to the heart itself comes from these arteries called the coronary arteries. So we have over here the right coronary, the circumflex, anterior descending. The, the names don't matter. The point is that you have a, a few coronary arteries that provide uh, blood to the heart muscle itself. So sometimes what happens is over time, um, people's coronary arteries uh, become diseased and plaque builds up in them. And if uh, a plaque, piece of plaque ruptures and clogs that coronary artery, this is what we call a heart attack. All right. So a heart attack is primarily a plumbing problem, right? Cardiac arrest is an electrical problem. Heart attack is a plumbing problem. We have our pipes that are clogged. So when one or more of the coronary arteries becomes blocked, uh, not enough um, oxygenated blood is reaching the heart muscle, and that's what causes this, this heart attack. So why is it important to recognize a heart attack early and to treat it? Well, decreased blood flow is gonna cause heart damage to become, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the heart tissue to become damaged, and eventually, um, the heart will stop working and go into cardiac arrest. So a plumbing issue can become an electrical issue. And as we talked about, electrical issues of the heart are, are deadly. Okay, so now we know what a heart attack is. How do we, um, how do we uh, figure out whether a person is having a heart attack? So let's talk about some of the most common symptoms. So squeezing, chest pain, tightness. Um, I've had patients describe this to me as, as like an elephant sitting on their chest or a really heavy pressure on their chest. That's the most common symptom associated with a heart attack. There's also nausea and vomiting. There is jaw, neck, back, or arm pain. This is something called referred pain. Um, even though the heart muscle is what's becoming damaged, there's other parts of the body that a person feels pain in. Um, and it's a, an, an interesting phenomenon for, for a different time, but it's something important to know <clears throat> that this does happen. Um, and then shortness of breath is the is the last symptom. Um, it's important to know that both men and women are affected by by heart attacks. Sometimes in women, these symptoms are not as um, straightforward. A lot of times they don't have the same level of chest pain as a man would. But uh, it's important to know that both men and women do have heart attacks. And there are a lot of risk factors. Age is a is a big is a big risk factor just because the longer we live, the more plaque. Uh, can build up in those arteries and then eventually break off and cause that clot. All right, so how do we respond if we think someone's having a heart attack? So we want to call 911. Even if we're uncertain, time is very important, as we talked about. And then you want to have the patient sit down or lie down, have them in a safe, comfortable position. If they're awake and they're, un and they're responsive and they're able to safely swallow, um, and, you know, they're not allergic to an aspirin. You can offer them uh, 325 milligrams of aspirin. A lot of people have aspirin lying around the house. <clears throat> um, as long as it's safe to give them and they can swallow and they're not allergic, it's it's a good idea. Uh, the idea being that um, aspirin is a, is a medication that can break up uh, that plaque and hopefully prevent, um, you know, further tissue damage until that person is able to get to the emergency department. Uh, while you're waiting for EMS, it's important to gather their past medical history and their medication list. Um, you know, when patients come into the hospital, the faster we can get a, a history on them and, and know what medications they're on, the faster we can treat them appropriately. And sometimes patients come in off the street without family, and we don't know what to do with them. We don't know, you know, what their past medical history is, and we have to take a few extra minutes trying to dig through their chart if they have one. 
And so those minutes could be critical. So a patient showing up to the hospital with all that information, you know, sort of organized uh, is, is very uh, important. And then um, an important note is, as we said, heart attacks can lead to cardiac arrest. So be ready to begin CPR or have an AED on hand in case the patient becomes unresponsive. And like we talked about, unresponsive or without a pulse, not breathing, automatic CPR, automatic uh, AED. Uh, so just, you know, just just uh, for, for those interested at the emergency department, they're going to take the patient, they're going to do an EKG, they're going to check some labs. And even if the person is not having a heart attack, again, it's important just to go because they'll evaluate and they'll, and they'll treat accordingly. And, and it's always better safe than sorry. So that's a heart attack. Now I want to talk a little bit about a stroke. So what's a stroke? I want, to, I want everyone to think of a stroke as just a brain attack. A heart attack is a plumbing problem of the heart. A stroke is a, is a plumbing problem of the brain. So just like the heart has coronary arteries, so the brain has all these arteries that supply blood to it. So this is a picture from the bottom of the brain. Uh, and this is what we call the circle of Willis. And the circle of Willis has all these branches that dive into the brain and supply uh, the tissue. So what happens when one of these gets clot, clotted? So uh, it's called a stroke. Um, there's two kinds of stroke. There's actually an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. And ischemic just means lack of oxygen. So what happens here is the, the pipe gets clogged. And so if a blood vessel of the brain gets clogged, the, uh, the, the blood can't reach the brain and uh, the person has a stroke. The other kind of stroke is called a hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhage means to bleed. So what happens here is the pipe bursts. The blood vessel ruptures and blood can't be uh, properly delivered to the right place. And that also will cause uh, the person to have a stroke. So here's some pictures here. Over here, we see an ischemic stroke. So over here, the uh, pipe has been clogged. So the blood can't reach this part of the brain. And this gray part is the, is the ischemic tissue, the tissue that's not getting enough oxygen and the cells are dying. Similarly, over here, the pipe has burst. So instead of the blood going to the right areas in the brain, it's kind of just pooling up in, in the cracks and, and um, the blood is not reaching the, the, the proper parts of the brain. And again, um, these are both two types of strokes. Ischemic strokes are much more common. About 85% of strokes are ischemic versus 15% are, are hemorrhagic. All right, so that's what a stroke is. What does a stroke look like? How do, how do patients um, manifest uh, in terms of symptoms and things like that? So really what happens when a person has a stroke is there's a sudden change in the ability to move a body part or to balance, to speak, or to comprehend and pay attention. It's really always a localized um, phenomenon, meaning there, there, there are specific signs uh, in specific parts of the body. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit. So the most common type of stroke affects the arm, the face, and a person's ability to speak. And it's going to be on one side of the body. So why is that? So if we look again here at our circle of Willis, this artery right here is called the MCA, the middle cerebral artery. So that is the most commonly clotted um, uh, artery uh, when we talk about stroke. So when you clot this artery, it's responsible for providing blood to the parts of the brain that control the arm muscles, the face muscles, and the part of the brain that is involved with speech or attention, depending on which side of the brain we're talking about. So what happens when, when it clots off? So exactly uh, these three things are affected. The arm becomes weak, the face starts drooping, and the person is not able to talk. So that's the most common type of, uh, of stroke, an MCA territory stroke, right? You got facial drooping, you got arm weakness, and we have a slurred speech here. So you'll see this mnemonic uh, posted around <clears throat> fast. It stands for face drooping, arm weakness, speech, time to call 911. Um, uh, this is one type of stroke. Um, We'll talk a little bit more uh, about other types, um, but how do we respond? If, if a person's having a stroke, if they have these signs and symptoms, what, what do you do? So you call EMS, emergency services are on the way. Um, there's not much to do um, in terms of intervention while you're standing next to them, but very important to number one, make sure the patient is safe. If they're standing next to a balcony, they're standing next to stairs. If they were cooking in the kitchen, let's say they were using power tools, make sure the area is safe. Number two, establish a, what we call a last known well time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the world of neurology, um, the last known well time is one of the most crucial parts of uh, information we can have about a stroke patient. So one of the treatments for a stroke is called TPA or TNK. It's a clot busting medication. 
and um, a patient is eligible to get it if they meet certain criteria. One of those criteria is uh, it has to be within four and a half hours of their last well-known time. So if a patient comes in and, and uh, we know that um, an hour ago they were totally normal and now they have all these symptoms, so they're within that window for, for the medication. But if it's been more than that amount of time, then even if we're not sure, we can't give it because there's a risk that... Um, that they'll have a brain hemorrhage and so it can't be given. So establishing a last known well time is very important. Write it down, make sure to give it to the emergency medical services so that they can relay it on to, to the stroke team in the emergency department. Uh, unlike a, a heart attack, we do not give aspirin to a patient who's having a stroke. Why, you might ask, it's also a blood clot, right? Well, the problem is that 15% of strokes are caused by a hemorrhage, right? A hemorrhage is when the pipe bursts. And if you give aspirin to a patient who uh, has a burst pipe, it's just going to continue bleeding even more. So for that 15% of patients, the aspirin is actually going to um, make them worse and not make them better. So you never give aspirin uh, to a patient who's having a stroke. And number four is you want to gather their medication list, try to establish their past medical history, just like the patient with the heart attack. Um, if they've had prior strokes, that's very important. If they're taking any blood thinners, that is a, a really crucial piece of information because then they're not eligible for that uh, clot busting medication. If they're on a blood thinner already and we give them that uh, that that clot uh, busting medication, it could cause further hemorrhage, which is a, a very um, dangerous thing. So we have to know all the medications that are on, all their past medical history. So again, having that gathered and put together is is very helpful. And again, begin uh, be ready to start CPR and AED if the patient becomes unresponsive at any time, which could happen if it's a large enough stroke. Eventually, it might reach the part of the brain that that um, involves consciousness and and wakefulness and um, basic functions such as breathing. So we have to be ready for CPR at all times. All right. So we said we talked about one type of stroke, and that's the most common type of stroke. Again, many types of strokes exist. Look over here. Um, this is the MCA we talked about. So these two are MCA strokes. All these other territories could be involved if a stroke happens. Uh, so I just wanted uh, you know everyone to know that um, uh, it's not always facial droop or arm weakness or speech. A, a lot of things can happen. So with that said, I think the paradigm I, I want everyone to take away is that if there's any sudden change in the ability of a person to move, balance, speak, comprehend, pay attention, and, and there's no other systemic cause that could be causing you, right? If a person had a car accident and they, they've been through a trauma and all of a sudden they can't move their arm. So, you know, you don't go around saying, okay, they, they may have had a stroke. But if they're cooking in the kitchen and next thing you know, um, they can't move their left arm or something of that nature. So, uh, you know, think stroke. And, and again, better safe than sorry. Why? Time is brain. In neurology, we always say time is brain. Uh, one minute of... Uh, of, of the brain not getting oxygen, up to 2 million neurons are gonna, are gonna die. Neurons are brain cells. So um, time is of, is of the essence and we're always gonna err on the side of caution when it comes to, to emergencies like this. All right, that wraps up stroke. Let's talk a little bit about fainting or syncope. All right, so fainting um, and syncope are different from uh, cardiac arrest because they're temporary. It's a temporary loss of consciousness. And it's very important to know that the entire time the patient continues to breathe normally. So two important points. Fainting is temporary and the patient is breathing the entire time. Uh, as you know, many things can cause a person to faint. There, there are certain, several types of, of um, uh, etiologies in, in medicine that we relate to fainting, uh, you know, dehydration, a person, I, I one time was at a, a bris and a person saw blood and fainted. So we know there's a lot of things that can cause fainting. That's not for tonight's talk, but uh, if a person does faint in front of you, what do you do? So number one is you check for breathing, right? You want to make sure they actually fainted and they're not having a cardiac arrest. If they're breathing, they have a pulse. Okay. So they're, you know, it's not a cardiac arrest. You, know, you want to lie them down, have them raise their legs <clears throat> and loosen any tight clothes they have around them um, so that they can be comfortable. Um, and then hopefully, since it's a faint only and it's temporary, they're eventually going to wake up and then you offer them some water and just let them recuperate. So that brings us to when do you call 911? If the person is unconscious for more than a minute, you know, that's, uh, 
that's a situation when you would want to get emergency services involved. Anytime you can feel for an irregular heartbeat, now this might take some training, but if you feel a person's heart rhythm um, and it's not uh, normal, um, then you want to think that maybe it's a cardiac related issue that caused them to faint. And so we're, we're concerned that there's something underlying. It's not just that they saw blood and they fainted. It's there's a heart problem. So we want to go get it checked out. Similarly, if they're having chest pain, if they're having difficulty breathing, any blurred vision, confusion, trouble talking. So these can be signs for either a stroke or a, or a heart attack. And so that's when we would want to get emergency services involved. Uh, but, you know, not everyone that faints needs to be seen <clears throat> in the emergency department. I think that's an important um, point to note. If they if they come back to it within, you know, a few seconds and they're back to normal and they have no other symptoms, then, you know, it's really okay to just let them recuperate and, and go about their day. All right. So let's talk a little bit about a seizure. What, what is a seizure and, and how are we going to respond? So a seizure is a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance of the brain. <clears throat> so we've been talking about electrical problems and plumbing problems. A seizure is an electrical problem um, of the brain. So some seizures, uh, actually, they won't even be detected by the naked eye. They, you know, a person could be having a seizure in front of you and you might not know it. And it just might manifest as a behavioral change or affect a specific part of the body. Like they're going to twitch, uh, they're going to have a twitch in their foot. That could be a seizure and you don't know it. So, you know, really tonight, the kind of seizures we're talking about are, are seizures that lead to a full loss of consciousness and generalized body jerking. These are the kind of seizures you see on TV that everyone's used to seeing. It's called a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And that's really uh, when the entire brain's um, uh, wiring system goes haywire for a little bit. <clears throat> um, so you see someone having a seizure, how do you respond? Number one, you want to make sure they're safe. Like we talked about, if they're using tools, if there's a fire nearby, if there's stairs nearby, you want to make sure they're in a safe area. <clears throat> Number two, you want to protect their airway. Um, we do this by turning the patient to their side. Uh, sometimes what happens when a person when a person has a seizure is they end up vomiting uh, what they had eaten, and that could uh, go back into their windpipe, uh, causing them to choke, and we don't want that to happen. So. The way we protect the airway is by turning the patient to the side and staying alongside them the entire time, uh, making sure that if we do feel that their airway is compromised, we can intervene. Uh, an important note is that you want to mark the exact time the seizure started. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why this is important, but essentially, if a, if a seizure is is is, take, is, uh, is going on for more than five minutes, uh, it's called status epilepticus, and it does need uh, emergent treatment um, more than five minutes. And at that point, the brain is taking enough of a burden where it can become damaged. But the truth is that a seizure that's one, two, three minutes is really not going to cause any permanent damage to the brain. The most dangerous thing about um, about seizures is uh, is people becoming injured as a result of their surroundings. So that's why it's so important to make sure the surroundings are safe. Uh, that, uh, and then an uh, important point is don't attempt to restrain them, right? Just clear the area and let the seizure sort of play itself out. You want to put something soft underneath their head, make sure nothing's in the area that's going to fall on them. They're not going to fall off some stairs, as we said, things of that nature. But uh, a seizure that lasts only a few minutes, less than five minutes, is, is not supposed to cause any permanent damage to the brain. Seizures are scary. They're, they're very scary if you've ever seen them in real life. Um, but again, they, they're not as uh, dangerous as a stroke or a heart attack or things of that nature, because it's really just the brain going a little haywire for a little bit, and then it kind of calms down and goes back to normal. If it's longer than five minutes, that's when we worry that the, that the, there's too much of a burden on the brain, and that's when um, we're a little more concerned. So here are those steps we talked about. You want to turn the patient to the side. Um, if you don't have anything soft, place their, place their own hand under their, under their head and um, just let the seizure kind of uh, finish its course. After the seizure ends, you, you should expect them to be uh, a little bit dazed. We call this the post-ictal phase when uh, the patient maybe may not know where they are or what's going on, and they may be a little bit uh, starry-eyed and looking up into space. That's normal. You want to sit them up, allow them to recuperate, offer them some water. So when do we call emergency services if someone's having a seizure? Um, generally, if it's their first seizure, 
then that is something that you know we want to get checked out. So we would call the uh, the ambulance to come take them to the ED, and we do a full workup in in the emergency department to figure out why they had a seizure. If the person is pregnant, automatically we want to take and make sure the the fetus is also healthy. If the seizure lasts more than five minutes, or the person has several back to back seizures, so let's say they have a seizure that lasts one minute, and then two <clears throat> for two minutes they're back to normal. And they're a little post but then again, they go into another seizure, and that happens several times. That's something that needs to be checked out. And then anytime there's concern for injury during the the, seize, the seizing or there was a compromised airway, you think that they can't breathe, uh, they have difficulty breathing. So again, that's when we want to call emergency services. But if I think the point is that if it's a person that has a history of having seizures uh, and they have one small seizure that maybe lasts one or two minutes, and then they come back to it and there's really nothing else going on. Um, that's what we call a breakthrough seizure. Um, since they have a history of, of seizures, it's not um, necessarily uh, an indication to, to call emergency services right away. Just to keep that in mind. All right, let's talk a little bit about choking. So <clears throat> choking, uh, as we all know, is the inability to breathe due to a blocked windpipe. Um, why is this dangerous? Well, no breathing means no oxygen, and that can cause irreversible brain injury and, as we talked about, cardiac arrest. Uh, so how do we respond? Uh, we want to call 911, and I think um, I put this in capital letters. We, we don't stick our fingers down a patient's throat when they're choking. We don't do that right away. That's, that's not the initial step. Um, and I, I put this in capital letters because, uh, as as many of you know, at U City Show we had an incident when where a child was choking and people were running around screaming, "Stick your finger down down his throat and try and get it out." And that's not the initial step. That's not the first step you take. So uh, this is a little bit of a complicated algorithm in terms of how we want to approach a, ch a choking person. So we'll maybe go through it twice. But the first thing is, if a person is not responsive, you immediately begin CPR. If they're not responsive. They're not breathing. They don't have a pulse. Doesn't matter that they're choking. You need to save their brain. You need to save their heart. You you immediately begin CPR, and uh, at the same time, the idea is that the pressure from the compressions might dislodge the object. And only then, if you think that the object is dislodged and you see that it, it is now kind of loose in their mouth, then you can do a finger sweep to try and remove it. But the initial reaction to someone choking is not to stick your finger down their throat. Uh, simply because it might push the object further down the windpipe and cause it to become more stuck. So if a person's not responsive, we do CPR. So what about a person that is responsive? And this is most of the time when we see a person choking, this is the scenario we're dealing with. It's an actively choking person. But you want to ask yourself, can they speak? Can they cry? Or can they cough? Because if they can, so the, um, the, uh, the, what's going on is it's a partial obstruction. And the entire airway is not is not fully obstructed. So what we want to do is encourage a strong cough. If a person can cough, cough themselves, the easiest way to get that to get that um, object out is to encourage them to cough it out themselves. So we hold off. We don't do any black blows or abdominal thrusts, and we we try and have them cough it out. Now, if it's a child who is not going to listen and not going to cough, or it's a person who's trying and you see that they're they're not succeeding. So then uh, we move on to the step where we, we assume now this is a complete obstruction. And so that's when we're going to do our basic life support and, and initiate uh, our, our pathway. So what do we do? So the first thing we start with is a, is a back blow. You, you hit the patient really hard on their back and you hope that that dislodges the object from their throat. You repeat this five times. If that doesn't work, then we move on to what's called an abdominal thrust. And I'm going to show pictures of this uh, in, a, in a second here. So we do back blows five times. If that doesn't work, we start abdominal thrust. This is what we call the Heimlich maneuver. In adults, um, we've all seen it. Uh, I'll show pictures in a second. It's a little bit <clears throat> different in infants who are less than one year old. Um, so here's what it looks like for infants. You wanna place them on your arm and using using the palm of your hands, you, you give five back blows as hard as you can. Uh, and, and, you know, you really don't hold back here. Uh, the least of our worries is, is that you're going to hurt their back or something of that nature. You hit, you hit them um, really hard and you hope that that dislodges the object. If that doesn't work, you turn them around and you start abdominal thrust. So with infants, um, it's, it's two fingers. Um, uh, and this is all something that you will learn in CPR training. So again, this is not the, the point of this course is to not get everyone, you know, CPR certified uh, that we really need to practice this in person uh, when we put that event together. But 
knowing uh, what to do and, and sort of how to do it can still uh, be very useful. So uh, this is what it looks like in an infant, the back blows and then the, using the two fingers to press really hard um, uh, on under the sternum, basically uh, uh, above the, the belly and to try and dislodge that object upwards. Uh, and in adult, the back blows, you want to place your arm uh, in, on their chest and then using your other arm, you hit their back really hard. And the abdominal thrust, that's the Heimlich maneuver, you put your um, hands together, wrap them uh, under where sort of the bony part ends uh, under the chest and you squeeze as hard as you can you do that five times and hopefully that that dislodges uh, the object so just because it's a little complicated just to go through it, through it again if the patient is not responsive you immediately begin CPR hopefully that dislodges the objects and at the same time we're hopefully providing uh, blood and oxygen to to the body if they are responsive and they're actively choking if they can cough you can try you you should try and get them to cough it out themselves if not, then you move on to the back blows, and once uh, if those don't work, then you move on to the abdominal thrusts, and you can repeat back blows to abdominal thrusts, and to do this sort of cycle. Um, if at any point in this process the patient becomes unresponsive, again we want to start CPR immediately. We don't continue trying to get the object out once once the patient is unresponsive. We really just need to focus on on uh, making sure that they're getting enough blood and oxygen to the important places until the proper um, equipment is it arrives with EMS that they can be able to go and fish out that object uh, manually. Um, so, uh, you know, just to just to include drowning victims in this scenario, um, it's not the same as choking, but a person that, that drowns uh, is going to uh, need CPR if at any point they become uh, unresponsive. And that is the, I don't have a, a dedicated slide, but that is the treatment for someone that drowns is to initiate CPR immediately and to get an AED in case their heart stops to to make sure that um, if it's a shockable rhythm, the AED can be there to shock them uh, back to life. Um, on a side note, there there are these new devices called deep chokers. And the idea is that you place it over the, the patient's mouth <clears throat> and you pull up this uh, reverse plunger and hopefully it sucks out the object. Uh, this is a fairly new invention in the past couple of years, of, as far as I know. Uh, we do have them in the shul in the back next to the AED. Um, the company itself, um, you know, wants everyone to know that really it's meant to be used after back blows, after abdominal thrusts, and after CPR have been done. And uh, the the standard of care is to really do all these steps first, and then to to resort to the deep choker. I don't know if there have been any studies done to see if <clears throat> if mortality is is improved by you know doing using the deep choker initially. So we we don't really want to be using these initially the 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 ideal way to treat a, a choking patient is to start with back blows abdominal thrust and then um to have this um on the side but we do have these available and I, and I do encourage everyone to to have them available in their institutions and in their organizations all right let's talk a little bit about uh major cuts or bleeding so what happens if a person is bleeding um, you know, we're not talking about a small paper cut here. We're talking about a, <coughs> a pretty big bleed. The first thing you want to do is find the source of, of bleeding. You want to cover the wound with a clean cloth and just apply pressure. The body will eventually, a uh, healthy body will clot off a uh, wound on its own as long as it's not a huge wound. If you apply enough pressure and, and prevent the blood from, from leaking out of the wound, it will uh, hopefully clot on its own. Uh, for larger uh, peripheral bleeds, what by peripheral we mean that um, it's on the arms or the legs and it's not a central location, which we'll talk about a little bit in, in a bit, you want to apply a tourniquet, which is a device that allows you to put apply a lot of pressure in a certain area to prevent blood flow from getting to that area. And you want to apply this two to four inches above the wound. So let's say a person had a cut over here, you would apply the um, the tourniquet uh, two to four inches above the wound and you strap it down and fasten it. Uh, if this is something that's also very good for, for, for places to have uh, on hand, just in case there's a, there's any major trauma or bleed, uh, this bar here is used, uh, you spin it and it tightens down the tourniquet even further. Um, again, a, a, a proper basic life support class should hopefully teach how and when to use these. But um, if you don't have a tourniquet on hand, a belt could be used or any thick fabric could be tied around the area and tied real tight uh, to prevent the, the blood from, from, from getting out uh, uh, down the line. 
uh, what if you're dealing with a large fleet, but there's no tourniquet available, there's no belt available, there's nothing you can do, or the tourniquet, um, you apply it, but it still doesn't stop the bleeding because it's too big of a bleed, or uh, we're bleeding from an area in the neck or the armpit or the groin, and these are the central areas I was talking about. You can't really apply a tourniquet in these areas for more than one reason. Number one is it's hard to really get a tourniquet up and, and two to four inches past any of these areas. Uh, and number two is these um, the blood vessels in these areas supply uh, other vital organs. So if you cut them off, you're not just cutting off that 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 part that's bleeding. You're cutting off other important parts of the body. So we can't do that. We can't you know cut off circulation to the entire uh, bottom half of the body or something like that just because there's a bleed um, in a certain part. So you can't use a tourniquet in these areas. So what do you do? So you wouldn't to want to pack and stuff the wound with a clean gauze or a cloth, and then again, apply intense pressure. And, and you stand there and you hold and you hold and you hold and you hold until either you can see that the blood has stopped or until uh, EMS arrives and, and they're able to uh, take care of the situation. Um, we do have these uh, newer gauzes, it's called quick clot. It's basically a gauze that has a hemostatic agent in it. It's a, it's a sort of a medication, so to speak, that allows the blood to clot faster. Uh, and we have these available in the show. It's um, under the uh, AED right next to the D chokers. There's a few of these packets. So if there's ever a big bleed and we need um, to try and control it, you can use this as a gauze and not only will it work as a regular gauze, but it also uh, clots up the blood a little faster. So just, uh, uh, and the, these are available. You can have them in your house. You can buy them on Amazon. Um, you can buy them anywhere. Talk a little bit about burns. Um, and then this is our last topic. We'll do a quick summary and then take some questions. All right, so burns, we all know uh, what a burn is. Um, a first degree burn is usually a common household burn. You touch a hot pot, you pour some tea on yourself and things of that nature. Uh, second degree burn gets one layer deeper. Um, and then a third degree burn is subcutaneous. And now we're having some tissue involvement. Some, some of the deeper layers um, are involved. And there's also a fourth degree burn not shown here. That's that's really bad burn. Um, so what do you do if someone if someone burns themselves? So with these minor burns, first and second degree burns, you want to just cool the area under running water for 10 plus minutes. Uh, you can use burn cream, ibuprofen for pain control, and then we just allow the body to heal. Uh, you know, if a person spills uh, some hot water on themselves, it's it's a usually a minor burn, and and the body will heal itself. Um, more of an emergency would be a major burn, and and that would be anything that encompasses a third or fourth degree burn. So you know we're talking more than just the superficial layer of the skin. Um, any uh, large area burns would be considered a major burn. Let's say an entire leg or something like that, or an entire arm. Even though it's superficial, it's since it's a large enough area that could be dangerous. Uh, any chemical burns um, uh, are considered major burns. If there are early signs of, of some swelling of the entire arm or leg or body part, that's an important uh, thing to take note of and to, to seek assistance for. And then uh, commonly, if, if there's a burn on a sensitive area like the hands and face, so we consider that uh, more of a major burn simply because we want to have it evaluated and treated, even though it might not be uh, a, a really bad burn. But since it's in a sensitive area, it should really be looked at. Um, and then if there's any concern for smoke inhalation, so uh, that's, you know, part of the pathway where we want to have a more evaluated more. So in scenarios like this, the response really should be, um, you know, protect from further harm. If, if the burn was from a fire, make sure there's no harm of a further injury to anyone else, to the person from that fire. Uh, you know, if they're, if they burn themselves, uh, I, my brother one time was running through the shul and they had a, a large, huge crock pot or a kiddish uh, that they were cooking cholent and somehow or another the top was off and uh, he ran and he fell and his entire arm fell into the to, to the pot of cholent. Um, so you want to make sure that pot of cholent is covered before, you know, another person falls, falls into it and things of that nature. Uh, you want to call emergency services if um, you deem necessary that, you know, this is something that needs to be looked at or checked out. And obviously, these things we talked about up here uh, are important to, to be looked at. Uh, if it's a really bad burn and if it's anywhere around the neck or the face, you want to make sure that the person's airway is intact. If it's not and they're at risk of, of uh, not being able to breathe well, you again, you want to have CPR and AED ready on hand. Um, 
while EMS is on the way. Uh, you should remove any clothing or jewelry from the area of the burn unless it's stuck. If it's if it's already burned and charred in there, then you can do further damage by removing it. So you really want to just leave it unless, you know, let's say a person has an upper arm burn, you can take their watch off if it's not affected in the area. You want to make sure it's not it's not going to affect the the uh, the burned area. So you can take that off. Um, and then until EMS arrives, you want to loosely cover the area with gauze or a clean cloth to make sure it doesn't get uh, dirty or, or, or further injured. Um, and really, the, the treatment is going to be done in the emergency department. Um, so that, that's really those are the steps to take. All right. So those are really all the main topics just to go uh, through everything really fast. So person has a cardiac arrest. Call 911 CPR AED. Their heart has stopped. You need to make sure that they're getting enough blood to their to their brain. A heart attack. Um, you call 911. You can give them a, a aspirin and 325 milligrams of aspirin. By the way, is just the equivalent of four baby aspirins. A baby aspirin is 81 milligrams, so you can just give them four baby aspirins. You gather their medical info and you wait for EMS to arrive. Uh, a person's having a stroke. 911. You want to mark the time again. We want to know a last known well. Very important. And then you gather the medical info. If a person faints, you check for breathing. Uh, if they're breathing, you have them lie down. You offer them water when they when they uh, sort of wake back up. You can call 911 if it's longer than one minute when they're unconscious or if there are any signs of a stroke or a heart attack. If a person has a seizure, you want to clear the area, make sure they're safe, protect their airway by turning them to the side. Uh, mark the time because if it's longer than five minutes, you're calling 911. If it's their first seizure, if they're pregnant, um, or if they're injured, you would also call 911. Uh, if a person is choking, you call 911. Uh, you try and have them cough it out if they can. Uh, if not, then you start with back blows, move on to abdominal thrusts, and if at any point they become unresponsive, we're uh, initiating CPR and getting an AED. Uh, for bleeding, big bleeds, you identify the location, you apply, you apply pressure, you use a tourniquet and quick clot if appropriate, and you just um, uh, make sure that you apply that pressure until hopefully the bleeding stops. Uh, for major burns, we call 911, we ensure safety of the area, remove any clothes or jewelry unless they're stuck, and then we cover with a gauze or a clean cloth. And that's it. Any questions? Ben Yashikaya, that was incredible. Uh, very well presented, very clear, very thorough. Tiskul mitzvot. That was, uh, that was awesome. So if anybody has any has uh, any questions, I, I think initially we should try to chat the questions. This way it'll allow the responses to go faster. And after any questions are chatted, then um, we'll take any any uh, verbal questions. Give a moment for to, to keep an eye on the chat. If nothing comes up, then feel free to uh, unmute yourself. All right, Ben, go ahead. There's a few coming through. All right. Do you always do rescue breathing when you do chest compression? Yes. Anytime you do CPR, you're going to, uh, this is something we're going to learn in, in our CPR class when we do it together, hopefully soon. But yes, you uh, alternate between chest compressions and rescue breathing. Um, the compressions get the blood flowing through the arteries, get them to the right place, but uh, you need oxygen in the blood otherwise the blood is useless that's why you have to alternate between rescue breaths and chest compressions what's a tia a tia is a trend um uh is an um uh, excuse me a tia is is basically you can think of it as a, as a mini stroke uh, it's not really a stroke but it's when a person has a blood clot in their brain that uh, is there temporarily and then goes away so what happens is is uh, the blood clot is in the brain. It causes all these symptoms to happen. So for example, they might have their upper arm, they can't really use it and their face is, uh, uh, is droopy and, and they can't speak, but then it goes away within an hour. By the time they get to the hospital, uh, there's no signs or symptoms of a stroke. Um, it's called a transient ischemic attack. It's transient because it goes away, ischemic because there's no oxygen getting to the brain and it's an attack because it's your, your brain's getting attacked. So uh, it's it's like a pre it's like a pre stroke. And so anytime someone has a TIA, they're at risk for having a, a real stroke. And so we want to make sure that they follow up and have, um, uh, you know, the appropriate care to make sure that they don't actually have a stroke. Uh, let's see. How do you deal with it? Yeah, you do go to the hospital. If someone has, if you think someone's having um, a, a stroke, um, you go to the hospital even if it, it goes away because uh, there is a risk that it might that it might be uh, a sort of a preemptive, preemptively uh, a real stroke. So 
yeah. It was recorded. Uh, so hopefully we'll have this up uh, on UCD's YouTube website um, in the near future. Are there any, um, for strokes, are there sequences to strokes where it might look, it might have a beginning, but it's not finished and it might continue on? Yeah, so a stroke can, can start out one way and, um, and uh, get worse if, uh, if, for example, the blood clot, uh, so, so, so sometimes the blood clot might, might be downstream and eventually moves a little bit upstream and, and causes a bigger block than initially started. Um, uh, you know, usually any sort of symptoms for a stroke, you go to the hospital and the, the way we didn't talk about it, but the treatment for a stroke is, is multifaceted. Number one, the first thing they do if anyone's having a stroke is they put them in a CT scan. Uh, and the, the idea there is that you can tell from the CT scan if they're having an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. If they're having a hemorrhagic stroke, which again is the kind of stroke where the pipe has burst and now there's blood in the brain. So there is really not a lot we can do for a hemorrhagic stroke other than to control blood pressure and to hopefully uh, have the, the bleeding sort of subside on its own. Um, if they're having an ischemic stroke, which as we talked about is uh, about 85% of strokes. So there's an entire pathway. If they're um, able to, if they are eligible for what we call TPA, which is the clot busting medication. So then we give them the clot busting medication. And at the same time, if they're eligible to go through a thrombectomy, which is when the interventional neurologist will go up through the groin and go all the way up into the brain and try and pull that clot out. So then they'll also go for a thrombectomy. Uh, and that is something that has developed in the past 10 to 15 years. It's a fascinating and emergent field within neurology where um, they go into the brain and they take the clot out. Uh, and that is something that is also possible depending on which artery was blocked and uh, how long it's been. Usually it has to be within 24 hours of their last well-known time. Um, hopefully that answered uh, that question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you use the AD for choking. If a person is choking and they become unresponsive at any point and uh, they're not breathing or they don't, don't have a pulse, then you start CPR and you would work the AED into the CPR, yes. Uh, anytime a person is unresponsive, doesn't have a pulse or is not breathing, you initiate CPR and part of CPR is using that AED to make sure they're, they haven't had a cardiac arrest. Let's see, AED is used for cardiac arrest. Okay, this won't answer that. I just want to share something before the next question, Ben. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've had a couple months ago, we had the, the um, Red Cross CPR training, which a, a number of people took advantage of. We do have the opportunity, it looks like God willing, in February, we're looking towards a Sunday in February, to also have a, another training to get certified by the Red Cross in CPR where you could learn all these techniques and the proper way to go through CPR and use an AED. So um, if anybody is interested in signing up and joining something like that on a Sunday in February, um, we'll be putting together a spreadsheet. The show will put together a spreadsheet and people who are interested can, um, can let us know and we'll send out a link to, uh, to sign up and hopefully we'll be able to pull together a nice group. We already have an instructor uh, ready to go. And um, that'll, you know, that's certainly a very, very uh, worthwhile endeavor. I did it this past summer. And I do plan on refreshing my skills with the new session in February. It's definitely, uh, you know, it's something that it's, it's worthwhile, tremendous mitzvah, even to just be somebody who's ready, just in case, you know, a uh, situation crops up. All right, back to you, Ben. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think if, if there's one thing we could take away from this talk, it's that uh, we should all be CPR certified and we can be and everyone should be. Um, uh, it's really important and it, and it really does save lives. Um, I see one more question. With a stroke, when do they go through the leg? Uh, so that would be when they want to do a thrombectomy, which is when uh, certain situations, uh, if the stroke is in a certain artery, uh, a large enough artery, and it's within a certain amount of time, uh, and they're a certain age, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So they might consider doing the thrombectomy where they go in through the groin, they put a catheter up and they go up into the brain and take that clot out. So that's really the only time they would do it.
All right. I think that was all the questions. Anyone else? Okay. Yes, you call. No problem. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for joining. So You're much. welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye. you, Ben. To Have a wonderful night, everybody. Thanks, Ben. Thank Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.